Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 30. I'd also like to uh, mention, in case you all aren't aware, <clears throat> um, sorry I'm going to embarrass you, Colleen, but Colleen over here and her fiancé Bill are getting married on November 7th, so we, we want to be praying for them as they get married. They're getting married here at uh, 2 in the afternoon, and so we just want to be uh, in prayer for their, their time their, these last few weeks leading up to their wedding and uh, you know, COVID has uh, wreaked a little havoc as it has with so many weddings in terms of attendance and that kind of thing. So uh, anyways, we want to be in prayer for them. So just hold them in prayer for the next uh, three weeks or so until we uh, get to that date. And uh, we're really looking forward. We've been meeting together, talking about premarital stuff, and it's been a real joy just to work with them and to see their heart for the Lord and to know that, you know, when a, when a couple's coming together, if they're believers in Christ and they're committed to the Lord and they're committed to one another, and it's all just being done according to the word of God, it's just such a blessing. So we're, we're just excited for what God's doing um, in their lives. So uh, with that, Genesis chapter 30, we're going to look at both 30 and 31 this morning. Some of these Old Testament narratives, you know, there's, there's a lot of verses here. Don't get overwhelmed by that. We're going to look at sort of the story and the themes of what is happening in these stories. So as we continue this morning, Genesis 30. So let's take a look here. Let's read a few of these verses down to verse 8, th chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. And then we will jump into the study. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, <clears throat> Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, Here is my maid Bilhah, go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Nephthali. So Lord, please add your blessing to the reading of your word and to all of the scriptures that we will take a look at this morning. And as we study, Lord, as we look at your word, we trust that you will minister to us the things that we need to hear. And as we've prayed already, Lord, we know that you will speak to us in, in the way that we need to hear the things that we need to hear this morning. So we trust that you will do so in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as we are going through the book of Genesis, we've come to the place where you may remember previously, Jacob had run from his father's house after he and his mother, Rebecca, had deceived his father, Isaac, and his brother, Esau, to steal and to take by force the birthright and the blessing that God had promised to him while he and his brother was, were still in the womb. And so he's now run to uh, the land where his mother had come from and actually where Abraham and his brothers were born and had come from. And he was sent back there to find a wife of his father's family, uh, a wife that would be of the same mindset, of the same ideas, uh, believing in God. Um, and so as he went back in chapter 29, as we looked last week, we looked at how God had led him to his wife and how um, you know, as he went back, he wanted to have Rachel. He fell in love with her. She was the second daughter, but uh, Laban deceived him on the day of the wedding after he had served for seven years, and on that day, uh, he gave Leah instead, and, you know, in our minds, we look at that, and we say, how could that be? How could you not understand that? But then, um, you know, he gave him Leah anyway, and that was not Jacob's first choice, and so he then gave him Rachel after another seven years. So he served 14 years of hard labor to get his wife, Rachel. 
And then as we saw at the end of chapter 29, verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. And so we began to talk about how Jacob, remember his name means sneaky thief or heel catcher or supplanter, and how Jacob, like so many of us, um, had control issues. And he wanted to orient things in life according to, to his manipulation, to his scheming. And certainly that's the way, at least from his perspective, he had done it with he and his mother uh, stealing the birthright or gaining the birthright, again, even though God had promised it to them from the womb. And so we are seeing now a process take place in Jacob's life. God is going to use Jacob, obviously, through Jacob will come the lineage for the Messiah. And Jacob is a man who, as he comes uh, to the land where he's taking his wife, he's a man who, uh, as he travels, is very much under his own influence and control. But God wants to bring him under his influence. And so we saw as he was traveling that he had that experience in chapter 29 um, there with, um, you know, coming to the Lord, having that, that experience with the Lord and, and what we call Jacob's ladder where he saw the ladder coming down from heaven with the angels ascending and descending and God speaking to him as far as we know for the first time as he is traveling and going to try and find a wife. And so what we're going to see, just as an overview, as we, we continue to go through these next few chapters, probably five or six chapters of his life, we're going to see what I've called this message, the taming of a man. As the Lord is bringing Jacob under his control, as the Lord is showing Jacob that he is really in control and not Jacob. And I believe what we will see today as we go through chapters 30 and 31 is that Jacob is slowly learning, he's getting it, he's understanding that he cannot manipulate things, that it is in God's control. So we saw last week at the end of the chapter that as the 12 sons of, uh, are being born to Jacob, and from these 12 sons would come the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. We saw in 29, um, 32 that Reuben was born and then in verse 33, that Simeon was born. And we will learn a little bit later on as we go through um, the, the study of the 12 tribes that Reuben and Simeon were later replaced by Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And they were sort of taken out of the lineup, Reuben and Simeon, because of terrible things that they had done in the sight of the Lord. So God replaced them with Jacob's two sons. Then in verse 34, we see that Levi came into being, who was son number three. Verse 35, that Judah was born, who was son number four. And so these first four sons came to Jacob through Leah. And remember, Leah was not in the plan. As Jacob came and he saw the two daughters, he fell in love with Rachel. He bargained for Rachel. He thought he got Rachel, but Laban turned the tables on him and he was given Leah, and then he was given Rachel later. And so Jacob had really wanted to have his kids through Rachel, but back in chapter 29 there, we had read that Leah was unloved, and the Lord had seen that she was unloved, in verse 29, 31, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So it's interesting, God did the exact opposite of what Jacob was hoping to have take place. We find out here in um, 29.35 with Judah, Leah was still hoping that Jacob would love her for the sons that she had borne to him. She was hoping that he would turn and see that God was actually blessing her. And it must have been painful for her to have to give herself to a husband who was only doing his duty and not sharing his affection. But the birth of her fourth son seemed to bring a new joy to her life, for she called him Judah, which comes from the Hebrew word meaning praise. And instead of complaining to the Lord about her unresponsive husband, she was now praising the Lord for his blessings, saying, this time I will praise the Lord. So isn't it interesting how 
we can look at our circumstances, we can look at our situation, and we can complain to the Lord, right? We can become bitter. We can, can become envious. And in this particular case, Leah was envious of Rachel because although Rachel couldn't, or, or at this point wasn't having children, she was envious of her sister because her sister was receiving all of the affection of her husband. And she had hoped that through the children, God would put love in her husband's heart for her. But so far, it seems, that hadn't happened. So finally, she determined, well, I'm going to praise God anyway, even though things are not going the way I want. So now we can see in the story that things are not going the way Jacob wanted, things are not going the way Leah wanted, and things are certainly not going the way Rachel wanted. So we come to chapter 30, verse 1. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. So Leah was envying Rachel because she had the affection of her husband, and Rachel was envying Leah because she was having children, and Rachel was not able to have children. And so she has this incident with her husband, and she said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. And in this moment, Jacob's anger, it says in verse 2, was uh, aroused against Rachel, and he said to her, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? You know, acknowledging that these things are in the hands of God. Now, there's some lessons we can learn here. Rachel was blaming Jacob for her troubles. But in reality... Uh, the issue of not being able to have children was not Jacob's fault, but it obviously was the Lord's doing. A number of times through the scriptures we have seen where the Lord opens and closes the wombs of women. And it's not just God's sovereignty over the womb or over childbirth, but it's God's sovereignty over everything. And if we were to just do a study over uh, of God's sovereignty over how children are born. We could look at so many places. We could look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. We could look at uh, John's mother, Elizabeth. We could look at Hannah and how God had closed her woman to a certain point when he allowed the prophet Samuel to be born. So God, of course, had his ways of dealing with people and bringing things about in his time. And one of the things that happened here, uh, both with Rachel and with Leah, was this issue of envy. And she envied her sister, Rachel envied Leah, and Leah, of course, envied Rachel. Now, her anger, her frustration, her bitterness came from envy. And I'd like to read a couple of scriptures to you this morning just to point out the issue of envy. And although we may not think that envy is a real problem, you know, for me, for you, uh, it is something that crops up in our lives. James says in James 3, 14, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. You see, envy is rooted in selfishness. This wisdom does not descend from above, that is the, the wisdom about uh, envy and self-seeking, but he said, it is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So in other words, self-centeredness from which envy springs, comes from a place that is earthly and sensual and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And that is what is happening in the household of Jacob with his two wives. And they have this envy war, and this envy war continues for many, many years in their household. And he says here, James continues in chapter 4, verse 1, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? In other words, a desire to control, a desire for self and selfishness. This principle shows us the need to stop looking to how God deals with others and set our eyes on him. Jesus taught the same principle to Peter in John 21, you may remember the situation. They were there on the shore of Lake Galilee. Jesus had been resurrected, and he was appearing to the disciples who had gone back to fishing at that point. And as Jesus met them there on the shore, it's, uh, Jesus was having this interaction with Peter and John. And then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, referring to John, following following who also had leaned on his breast at supper and said lord who is the one who betrays you peter seeing him said to jesus 
Lord, what about him? And Jesus said, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You see, envy is always looking at the other person, isn't it? It's looking at what someone else has or how someone else is being blessed by God. And we look at uh, other people and we compare ourselves to them and we say, well, you know, why is God blessing them but he's not blessing me? And we always have these questions and we, why do they drive a nicer car than I do? Why do they have a, a nicer house and whatever form envy takes in our lives? But you see, envy is of our flesh. Envy is not from the Lord. And just as in the example between Peter and John and Jesus, the issue is always, what do you care what I'm doing with another person? You follow me. You set your eyes on me. I am the author and the finisher of faith. Set your eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him despised the shame and endured the suffering of the cross. The problem is we tend to want to get our eyes onto other people and to judge the situation by that, but we are to look to the Lord and to see what the Lord is doing or wanting to do with us. So Jacob spoke in this sense of anger to Rachel, saying, am I in the place of God? <clears throat> Perhaps there was a tone that he took with her when he spoke to her about this, but nonetheless, he certainly spoke truth in saying, am I in the place of God? I am not the one who has control over the womb. One commentator pointed this out that I hadn't considered, and this kind of gets to the heart of the dynamic in the home. It is likely that Rachel was vain and conceited. She knew that Jacob worked 14 years with no pay out of love for her, and also knew that Jacob would not have worked even one day for Leah. Isn't that sad when you think about it? And yet God in his providence gave Leah to Jacob first because God wanted Leah to be loved. So he, she said, this is Rachel speaking in verse three, here's my maid Bilhah, go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. And then she gave him Bilhah, her maid as a wife and Jacob went into her. Now Rachel is doing what Sarah had done in sending the maid in to Abraham. And of course they had Ishmael and God never recognized Ishmael. But in this case, God did allow it. And so she sent her maid in since she couldn't have children. God had closed her womb. And now Rachel is beginning to scheme to try and get what she wants. So she figures, hey, if I can't get it, maybe through my maid, which was an acceptable practice that you could give a servant to be a surrogate. And so uh, Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Now, this to me brings up the question when we think about what's happening here and how these people are acting with one another is how far will you and I go to get that which we want that God has not seen fit to provide? Let me say it again. How far will you and I go to get that which we want which God has not seen fit to provide? Will we try to manipulate circumstances and situations to get what we want, even though God has not provided, even though God has not blessed in that way? And again, here's the situation, here's the question. Will we allow God to provide what he wants to prov provide in his time and in his way according to his plan, or will we try to force the situation? You see, up till now, haven't we seen this pattern over and over in the book of Genesis? where people are trying to do things to make things happen that they want according to their plan, that God has not ordained, at least not yet, in the scheme of time. And then Rachel said in verse 6, God has judged my case, as he also heard my voice and has given me a son. There she, therefore she called his name Dan, which means judge. And so she's saying by naming him Dan that God has judged in my favor, and uh, so what she's saying is God has blessed my action through Bilhah, my maid. And I don't think that's actually true, but that is how she saw it. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister. So here's her mindset, right? Here's her attitude that she's wrestling with her sister. 
So before Jacob entered their life, 14 years ago, or however long it's been at this point in time, you know, when Jacob entered their, before he entered their life, presumably his sisters, they got along fine. But now Jacob comes in, he comes in to sweep her off her feet. And then before she can be given to the man who pledged his love to her, her sister's given before her. So now there's this bitterness in her heart. And she's wrestling with her sister. And indeed, she's saying, I have prevailed. And so she called his name Naphtali. So she's having her second son while Rachel's already, excuse me, while Leah's already born four sons. And so this, this envy, this competition continues. And here's a principle that we are not to miss. And here it is. You ready? Circumstances always reveal what's truly in our hearts. Circumstances reveal what is truly in our hearts. So this situation here, as she has the second son, and now she's saying, okay, Naphtali, which means my wrestlings or my struggle. And she's saying, hey, God has judged Dan. He's judged in my favor. Now he's giving me victory through my wrestlings with my sister. And that's her mindset. That's how she is seeing this situation. So the, the truth that's in her heart is being revealed as the circumstances are unfolding before us. In verse 9, when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, which she couldn't take because now her sister's sort of gaining ground on her, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave to Jacob as a wife. So she had not borne children in quite a while, and so she stoops to pragmatism, and she says, hey, we can't allow this to happen, that she might catch up to me. You know, I got to stay ahead of the game here. So she employs Zilpah, her maid, who bears Jacob a son, And then Leah said, a troop comes, so she named him Gad, which means troop or fortune, or could also mean luck has come. So you you can see the mindset here, saying, you know, God has seen to bless me. Now she has five to, to Rachel's two. And so this competition continues. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed So she called his name Asher, which means blessed or happy. And now we see what's going on in Leah's heart. Now we can see that she's doing things to be seen by others. She wants other people to voice their approval, saying, oh, aren't you a blessed woman? Now you've had, you know, child number eight, I think it is, you know, for her. Uh, Those two, four, five, six for her, but uh, eight so far in in the pecking order. So she's seeking others' approval, and we are told in the scriptures in many places that seeking the approval of others is a wicked thing, but no place no more clear than in Proverbs 29, 25, which says this, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And when it speaks of the fear of man, it's talking about looking for others' approval, doing things to see how others are going to respond or react to what I'm doing. So in verse 14, now Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? See her her mindset here. You took away my husband. Would you also take away my son's mandrakes? And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. Now, mandrakes were regarded to be um, a love apple, as they were called, an aphrodisiac, and some thought that it actually had an influence over fertility. So if, it, if you will, it would be like our modern day, sort of like a, a fertility drug. Uh, most people think, as they look back on this in history, that it was just a myth, uh, but it was something that, sort of like a placebo, people would, would take it or eat it and think, okay, now it's making us more amorous, it's uh, perhaps increasing the, the, the rate of fertility. Uh, but here's what happened. Uh, Leah's son had discovered these in the field, which these were fairly rare, so this was a great find. This is like finding a buried treasure or something. And so Rachel wants to take those mandrakes from Leah's son. And Leah, of course, reacts against that, <clears throat> and she and Leah and Rachel bargain. And so uh, Leah went out to meet Jacob in the field and said to him, you must come in to me tonight, 
perhaps it was his night to sleep in Rachel's tent, but she says, no, now we've talked, and now it's your night to sleep in my tent. And so he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son from her body. And Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So she's looking at it saying, God has blessed uh, what I've tried to do in, in going through my maid because God wasn't uh, working through my womb. So she named him Issachar, which means hire or wages. And then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun, which means dwelling. So she's looking at the situation now. She's zooming ahead of her sister and she continues to have these sons. And so at this point, she's had six sons. And now in verse 21, she bears a daughter. She called her name Dinah. And Dinah means judgment or vindication. And so she's now looking at the situation the way Rachel had looked at it earlier and said that God has judged or vindicated me in my actions and in my relationship with my husband. So what's the point as we go through this story and we see what's happening? It's how people are pitting themselves against one another in the same family. And this, this envy, this one-upsmanship, this competition is not only unhealthy, but it certainly is not what God had intended. And although God is allowing the blessing of the children and he's populating what would become the heads of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel through these crazy shenanigans, you know, God is certainly showing that he is sovereign and supreme in all of this and that God is willing to work with man's flaws and man's frailties. We should never mistake what we are reading here that God is blessing the evil schemes of man. It's rather more it's God is being merciful at how man is, is scheming and trying to do things in his own way. And so now God remembered Rachel in verse 32, and God listened to her and opened her womb. So now God begins to open and to bless Rachel. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. And so that's what Joseph means. Joseph is now son number 11. It's not till much later that Benjamin would be born. So 11 of the 12 sons have now come on the scene. And we would have to go a few years into the future to chapter 35 to find out about Benjamin. So in verse 25, now it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. So Jacob is now coming to the place and we're going to find out in a few minutes <clears throat> as we read on that the Lord had actually appeared to him in a dream and given, given him instructions. And so he comes to his father-in-law and says, send me away that I may go to my own place, to my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go for you know my service, which I have done for you. So he's sort of saying here, you know my integrity. You know how I have served you all of these years. And Laban said to him, verse 27, please stay. If I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Now Laban is using manipulation and flattery to get to Jacob, and he's very selfish, and he's obviously not wanting the source of his blessing to depart from him. Now Laban said uh, that this knowledge was learned by experience. Uh, there's a it could be better translated. Literally, this means that he learned it by divination. It's probable that Laban practiced occult divination, and by this he knew the source of the blessing. So we see Laban was not walking with God. He was not following after God. In fact, we're going to come up on this a little bit later when Jacob and his family begin to pack up and leave, that Rachel will go in and steal the family idols. And it's probably through those family idols that, J that Laban had been practicing this divination. So Laban is sort of, J Jacob's coming to him sort of on the level, man to man, saying, look, I've, I've served you, you know, time is up, it's time for me to go. 
And Laban's trying to manipulate the situation to keep him back. And then he said, verse 28, name me your wages and I will give it. You see, Laban is trying to buy the favor of God because he doesn't want the blessing that has come to him through Jacob to depart from him. But see, this, this reminds us, this shouts to us that anytime we have blessing in our lives, it is all of grace, isn't it? It's God's divine and holy favor to you and I that we even breathe. He gives us our breath. He gives us our life. He blesses us with good things. And that's the blessing of God. It's by grace. And there is nothing we can do to deserve it or earn it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. So Jacob said to him, verse 29, you know how I have served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what you had before I came was little and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming and now when shall I also provide for my own house? In other words, it's time for me to go out. Remember all the way back in the beginning, God said of the first marriage, leave and cleave. And that had not yet happened in Jacob's life. He had been under the watchful eye of his father-in-law and of the brothers. And so it's time for Jacob to go. And so he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. Now that might sound odd to us, but let's explain what's happening here. The honored goats would have been the black ones, and the honored sheep would have been the white ones. All the others with these markings would have been deemed sort of the defective ones, if you will. And Jacob is looking at the situation, and it would seem here that really he's sort of putting this before God almost as a fleece, And he's saying, will you give me all of the, quote, defective ones, all of the spotted and the speckled and the brown and the other colors? I'll take all those. So let's go through the flocks and do that. We'll separate them out. You keep all the good, the choicest of the flock, the black ones and the white ones, and I'll take all the defective ones. So let me pass through removing from there all of those. And it says here in verse 33, so my righteousness will answer for me in time to come. When the subject of my wages comes before you, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. In other words, Jacob is saying, I believe God's going to bless. And so we'll do it this way because that way we know we have a clear visual indication of how God has blessed me versus how God has blessed you. So Jacob said this wonderfully true and prophetic thing. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come. This is always true, isn't it? If we will allow our righteousness to stand and for God to prove our righteousness, in other words, let God take the right thing that we should always do and bless it. And that may take time, right? We have to get out of our mindset this idea of instantaneous and quick blessing. There's always the fruit and the root. There's always reaping and sowing. And we have to, if we sow to righteousness, we will reap righteousness. Jacob was willing to let righteousness stand the test of time and allow God to reward him rather than his own trickery. You see, this is the taming of the man. Jacob is learning to trust God. He's beginning to understand now after these 14 or so years of serving underneath his father-in-law, who was the master schemer and the architect of this deception, that the only way that this can work is if he believes in and trusts God. And Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. In other words, to Laban, this was a deal that was too good to be true. And so he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted and every one that had some white in it and all the brown ones among the lambs. And he gave them into the hand of his sons. So he didn't trust Jacob to do this. He called his sons together and he says, okay, I want you to go do this. Go separate the flocks in this way. 
And then Laban sent his sons with those separated flocks that he was giving to, to Jacob, three days journey, verse 36, between himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest, fed the rest of Laban's flocks. So now think about this three days journey. It's not like he just separated them by a couple of hundred yards. He's like, you go out of sight, three days journey. So there's no possibility of these things commingling or something happening or there being trickery or deceit during the night. So Jacob, verse 37, took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and the chestnut. And he peeled these white strips and exposed the white which was in the rods and the rods which he had peeled. And he set before the flocks and the gutters and the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the street. And so he went through this whole uh, process here. And it's interesting when you go and you read about what does all this mean? And is this a part of what we would have called back in that day animal husbandry? And was there wisdom in what Jacob was doing? And was there something there that was appealing to the animals or was you know, peeling these strips of wood and putting it in the trough and pouring the water on top, was that like an aphrodisiac for the animals that caused them to, to populate and to increase? And it's interesting, of all the commentators, all of them say, we don't know what any of this means. So I say to you, I don't know what any of this means. But it is something, obviously, that Jacob thought was going to be helpful to him in either way, God himself oversaw this situation and he did cause the flocks to populate. He caused Jacob to be incredibly blessed. In fact, if you look at verses 42 and 43, uh, but when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. And so Jacob was kind of running back and forth. So it seems taking care of Laban's flocks over here, three days journey back at the homestead, and then three days out in the wilderness, running back and taking care of his flocks as well. Thus the man, verse 43, became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants and camels and donkeys. So the ancient Hebrew here, the literal rendering would be the man burst out exceedingly, exceedingly. So this is the point where God just causes the blessing to explode. And God blessed Jacob, but note that it was not because Jacob was especially good. It wasn't because of anything that Jacob did. God is blessing Jacob because of the promises he had made to Jacob. It's because of the covenant, ultimately, that he made to Abraham. And in the same way, blessing comes from the Lord to us, not because we are great, not because we are good, but because of God in his mercy and his grace has formed a covenant with us through the, the Lord Jesus Christ and of his promises that he's given to us in his word. That's how God blesses. Not because of anything you and I do, but because of his goodness. So now we come to chapter 31 and we see Jacob now getting ready to flee and to separate from Laban. So Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's and from what was our father's, he has acquired all this wealth. But you see, that's not what happened, right? They made this deal together. Laban agreed to it and it was God who was blessing the work of Jacob's hands. It was not that Jacob was stealing. And again, we see envy coming in and the envy of, Jacob, of Laban's sons looking at Jacob saying, hey man, he's stealing. But in reality, they were envious of what God was doing through blessing Jacob's work. Envy is not uh, only bad on its own right, but also for the company it keeps. In 1 Corinthians, it says, For you are still carnal, for where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So it's interesting, envy and strife always go together, don't they? So we know that when we see in our lives, in our relationships, whether they be friendships or in our personal relationships, such as marriage and family, that when there is striving, that often envy is a component. And God doesn't think striving is okay. 
You know, some people would like to say, well, it's normal. It's just a normal thing for there to be strife in relationships. Well, it is because of sin, but not because that's God's plan. James said, again, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing is there. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, instead, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. So when we have envy and strife, it is the opposite of love. God wants to deliver us from envy, for we ourselves also were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's Titus 3.3. In other words, envy was a component of who we were before we came to Christ. Envy is not to be a component of who we are after we have come to know Christ. It should not be a characteristic of our lives <clears throat> as a Christian. Envy is no small sin. It put Jesus on the cross for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy, Matthew 27, 18. So envy is evil. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favorable toward him as before. So now his sons have poisoned the waters between himself and his father-in-law. Laban's countenance has fallen. And then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. So now God intervenes. And now we know at this point in his life that after the seven years he served for Leah, for the seven years he served for Rachel, that's 14 years, now he served another six years under Laban, doing this thing with the flocks, with the speckled and the spotted and all of that. Now in these six years, God has so blessed Jacob that his, his wealth and his bounty have exploded. So now we're at the 20-year mark. We'll find out in a moment. And Jacob is uh, needing to, to get out. He's needing to return. And so God speaks to him and God begins to move him along. And he says, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate moving. Anybody like to move? Now, going back to Abraham, remember Abraham as he was traveling about, he had somewhere north of a thousand people in his household. It's a small town around here, isn't it? And here now, Jacob, we aren't told. No, I haven't read anyone who said, you know, how many that God had blessed him with between his, his wives and his sons and his servants and all of that and certainly the flocks. Jacob had to be getting up there. And now God is telling him, it's time for you to move back 500 miles as the crow flies, probably 800 miles more likely because of the way the paths take you. It's time for you to move this mass of people to get out of here and to go back to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. So we have here a contrast between the voice of man and the voice of God. The voice of man is accusing and indicting between the sons of Laban and between Laban himself. But the voice of God here is instructive and comforting. And don't we always have that contrast? We have the voice of man telling us things, and often the voice of man, if you listen to the news, there's no peace, the world's on fire, everything's falling apart. But if we listen to the voice of God, God is saying, as we sang this morning, and perhaps you picked up on the theme, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. God hasn't spoken to Jacob for about 20 years now. Remember, the last time we have recorded was when he spoke to him at Bethel. And so now we are 20 years later and God is speaking to him saying, it's time for you to go and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field and to his flock and he said to him, I see your father's countenance that it is not favorable toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might, I have served your father and yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages 10 times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. Wow. Jacob saw this. He saw how Laban was. He saw how Laban conducted himself with him. Laban was constantly changing the terms of the deal. And if he said, today, I want you to do this, he would do it. And then tomorrow he would change the terms and do it differently. So 10 times over the course of 20 years, 
God changed, excuse me, Laban changed his wages in the terms of their working together. But it's good that Jacob finally, in an attempt to bring some unity to his home, called his wives together and said, look, here's what's going on with your dad. Now, there's a risk, right? Because this is their father. This is their family. <clears throat> and he's saying, you know how hard I've worked. You know how I have served your father. You know my integrity. You know that I didn't do anything wrong. And then he goes through this litany here in verses 8 through 13 of with the flocks and how he did the speckled and the streaked and all of that. And God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes in verse, 30, uh, verse 10. And that I saw in a dream and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted. And the angel of the Lord, excuse me, the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which, which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. Jacob's now revealing that the angel of God had appeared to him and told him basically to do this deal about, about the speckled and the spotted. And he said, so he spoke to me. So now he's telling him, telling them after the fact, many years down the road, some six years down the road, this is what God spoke to me and this is how I acted and that's why God has blessed. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks for I've seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel. So he's hearkening back 20 years. Remember when I spoke to you here? I'm that God. I'm that guy. Where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. So God is now calling back to Jacob's remembrance the vow that he made which, in which he said, I will serve you. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. So notice the angel of God. When we see the angel of God or the angel of the Lord, this is a Christophany or a theophany, meaning a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. See, it would have been enough that God himself was appearing to him, but this was the Lord Jesus even appearing to him. And God reminds him of this Bethel experience, and he holds him accountable to what he said. Jacob made a vow. God is holding him accountable for his vow. Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? So they're sort of questioning now, okay, is there an inheritance for us as we leave or are we kind of done here? Are we not considered strangers by him for he has sold us and also com completely consumed our money? So in other words, they're saying, they're recognizing that their father used them as pawns to make a deal with Jacob and God through Jacob blessed their father, and they're realizing we were just a part of our father's scheme. And they're realizing that their father really didn't love them. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. Well, this is great advice right here. As these two wives who have up to this point lived in strife and envy are now coming together in unity, so it seems. And they're saying, if God has spoken to you, husband, then you do what God has spoken to you, and we're with you. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels, and he carried away all of his livestock. So he rounds up the troops, and he says, let's get out of here. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, verse 19, and Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. So what prompted Rachel to do this. We don't know. I've, I've read several things that are speculative at best, but she went and she stole her father's household idols. And Jacob stole away. I love how it says that. Unknown to Laban the Syrian in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So Jacob now is acting out of fear. We're going to find out in the moment. Jacob had been told by God to go and had promised him safe passage, but Jacob's fear and deceptive departure show that he lacked confidence in God. So even though God had spoken to him, he was acting on his own and saying, no, I'm going to go. I'm just going to leave. And here's the issue. He could have announced his departure and gone in the glory of an army 
Instead, fear made it impossible to reap the full measure of the blessing. Fear will always cause us to do the wrong thing. Fear and faith are antithetical, meaning they are opposite. Fear and faith cannot peacefully coexist. There is no room for fear and faith. And where fear exists, faith does not exist. And where faith exists, fear is dispelled. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed toward the mountains of Gilead. And so they are heading out. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. And as he took his brethren with him and pursued for seven days' journey, he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. So at this point, through the seven days' journey, they were driving hard. They were getting closer to the land of Israel or to the land of Canaan. And Laban was told on that third day, and he went and he pursued him for the seven. But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor, nor bad. So once again, God intervenes. God comes to Jacob's rescue. But he does it by appearing to his father-in-law Laban, who as far as we know is a pagan and believes in idolatrous things. And he appears and speaks to Laban. And Laban says, okay, Laban listens to the voice of God. So Laban overtook Jacob, and now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brethren pitched their tents in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, once he caught up to him, what have you done? That you've stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with a sword. Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? Now, isn't this the pot calling the kettle black, right? He's saying, why did you deceive me? When all he did for the last 20 years was deceive Jacob. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons, meaning his grandsons, and my daughters, meaning his granddaughters and his daughters. And now you have done foolishly in so doing. It is in my power to do you harm, but the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. So it's interesting how God intervened. And now you have surely gone before you greatly long for your father's house, but why did you steal my God? So now he comes in, and he's, the thing he's really upset about is that somebody stole his gods, and he's quite sure someone in Jacob's entourage stole his gods. Listen, if your God can be stolen, <laughs> is it really a God? Psalm 115, why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. If you have anything or something that could be stolen or burned or lost that would cause you great consternation, then that may very well be an idol to you. Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid, for I said, perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. So notice that Jacob acted in fear, not in faith. This sounds very similar to how Abraham twice handled when he and his wife, Sarah, encountered first Pharaoh, and secondly, they encountered Abimelech. And then later, Isaac did the same thing when he and Rebekah encountered Abimelech. He had his wife lie, just as his father did, saying, hey, uh, she's not my wife, she's my sister. So they acted out of fear, and in the same way, now Jacob is acting out of fear, not out of faith. 
You see, faith often can be antithetical to logic and reason. Often we just have to trust God and let him handle things. God told Jacob to pack up and to leave. God told Abraham in the beginning of his life and his journey, hey, get out from your people and go to a place that I will show you. Well, where is that, Lord? To a place I will show you. You just start going. You start moving. Remember later, we're going to come to the city of Jericho, right? When the children of Israel are, are being told to possess the land, to go, go in and take it. And in that situation, God said, okay, here's the deal. I want you guys to march uh, once around the city, just in a quiet procession, each day for seven days, not speaking a word. Then on that seventh day, you'll march around the city seven times, and then you're going to beat the drum and, and give a shout unto the Lord. Now, did that make any sense to anybody? Does that sound like a good game plan? But you see, this is how God often did it, right? Didn't Jesus say to the disciples, 5,000 people here, plus women and children, probably 10,000 people. Hey, what do we have to feed these people with? I was like, are you kidding? We got a box lunch here from a kid. Well, bring it on over and let's pray. What? You see, fear and faith often, <laughs> they, they don't go together, but sometimes faith and logic doesn't go together, right? We think, okay, I'm only going to do it if it makes sense. But God will tell you to do things sometimes, as he often has in the scriptures, that don't make sense. Because he's saying, I'm going to do this, trust me. And isn't that the issue? Trust. So, whomever you find your gods with, don't let him live. He didn't know his wife, Rachel, his beloved wife, had taken them. And by God's grace, he doesn't find them. Laban went to Jacob's tent. He does this search. We have a CSI Gilead going on here. He can't find uh, the idols. And he comes to Rachel, who's sitting on the camel, and she has the idols in her saddlebags. And she says, let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is with me. And he searched, him, but he did not find the household idols. Then Jacob was angry, and he rebuked Laban. And Jacob answered and said, okay. And it would seem like in this moment that as Jacob unloads, that he has 20 years of pent up issues that he just releases. So you ever seen this happen? Or maybe you've done it yourself where something happens and there's this explosion, this emotional explosion. And these things are messy, aren't they? Where somebody just goes blah and they vomit all over you. And that's what happens here with Jacob. And he says, these 20 years I've been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. In other words, I could have taken, but I didn't. And that which was torn by beasts, I did not bring to you. It was known that if you were a farmer or a shepherd and, you know, wild animals tore uh, your animals, you know, you were supposed to come as the shepherd to the master and to say, look, you know, some of your flock was taken or attacked. And he said, I didn't even come to you. I just replaced what was lost uh, from your flock with my own. You know, this is the level of integrity I had, Laban, and how I served you. And you did not, re you required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the day the drought consumed me. So I worked in the, the hot 120 degree sun in the desert and the frost by night and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus I have been in your house 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. And you've changed my wages 10 times. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, the word fear there referring to God himself, and meaning the God of Isaac, God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had been with me. Surely now you would have sent me away empty handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands. And he rebuked you last night. Well, he's really letting him have it. But Jacob, in this moment, listen, he's learning and growing in his trust with the Lord. He's understanding that his life and his circumstances are in God's hands. He's understanding, finally, God is in control. And as we close out this chapter, Laban answered and said, these are my daughters, these are my children, my flocks, all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters and to their children whom they have borne? Let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness so they took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they made a large heap. 
and there they ate on the heap as a way of consecrating the agreement. Then Laban called it Jagar Sahudha, and Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me in this day. Therefore, its name was called Galid, uh, which means a heap of witnesses. All of that means a heap of witnesses. So this was a large memorial between them. And also Mizpah, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. In effect, the, the pillar of Mizpah meant if you come over on my side of this line, the pact is void and I will kill you. The covenant breaker would need God to take care of him because the other would shoot to kill in a manner of speaking. So that was this covenant that they had set up. And so he's saying, if you afflict my daughters or if you do harm to my family, uh, God will be witness and God will see and God will deal with you. And Laban said to Jacob, here's the heap, here's the witness, here's the, pi here's the pillar. I will not pass beyond and you will not pass beyond as well. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor and the God of their father uh, judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread, and they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. Now, for the last 20 years, we have not seen in Jacob's life an act of worship as he had when he met God at Bethel. But here he is finally coming back to worship, offering a sacrifice to God, and they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. Finally, after 20 years, this man Jacob is being tamed by God. He's changing, he's transforming into the man, finally, that God wants him to be. We need to learn to worship in all of the seasons of life and all of the circumstances that we face. You see, when the children of Israel, as you remember the story, when Pharaoh was chasing them and they were fleeing for their lives, literally, and they got to the mountain and there was the mountain on one side, the Red Sea on the other, and the army of Pharaoh on the other. In that moment, they stood and they said, what is, what's going to happen here? We're going to die. And then Moses lifted up his staff and he prayed. And the Lord put a pillar of fire between the, the army of Pharaoh and the people. And then he put his hand in the, the ocean, as it were, and he divided that sea and he allowed them to be delivered. And then as they got on the other side and they were safely delivered, then God removed the pillar and allowed the army to come after them. But what he did is he lured them in. And as they came in, he allowed the sea to close around them. And then remember on the other side that they sang this amazing hymn of praise and they had this incredible worship celebration. But as many have pointed out, and I would bring it to bear on this situation, why wait until after God gives the victory? to worship. Why not worship now in the middle of that which is challenging us? We need to learn to worship in all seasons and all circumstances. And early in the morning, Laban arose, kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them and then departed. And this is it for Laban. We hear no more of him going forward in the scriptures. So once again, the taming of a man. This is how God works. And I hope and pray that for me and for you, that it doesn't take 20 years for us to learn to trust God. But that's what happened here with Jacob. Now, we're all in process, aren't we? No matter how long you've known the Lord, God has been at work in your life since the day you said yes to him to this very day. And granted, there's probably been times in your life, just like there's been in mine, where you chased after the flesh, and you weren't walking with God, and then God had to bring difficult things into my life and to yours to teach us lessons. But those things are always to teach us to trust him, aren't they? They're to show us his love. They're to reveal to us his, his divine care and his watchful eye. And he's always telling us, I will never leave you or forsake you. In other words, don't act apart from me. Trust me, pray, seek my face, wait for me to speak, wait for me to move. But don't go ahead, don't run ahead of God, and don't go off course and do your own thing. You see, if only we could learn these things now, so that we don't have to go through the painful circumstances and situations where God allows us to reap the fruit of our flesh and to, to, to reap that which we have sown, 
so that we have to learn the hard way. Now, I don't know, know about you, but the lessons that I've learned the hard way, man, I have learned those lessons. But God wants us to be able to learn the lesson and then press into him and then to not go through those difficulties again. You see, it's okay to make mistakes. It's just not okay to keep making the same mistakes over and over, right? God wants us to learn and to grow. And just as God took Jacob through a time of taming, and we're going to see as he goes out to meet his brother, boy, there's some real humility that comes into his life. We're coming to that in the next couple of weeks. But for us, in the meantime, let's learn the lesson. Let's let God be our teacher. And let's embrace those things that he brings into our lives and to realize that God loves us and he cares for us. Amen. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you that you've been so kind and faithful to us. And Lord, help us to learn the things that you've brought into our lives to see and to understand. Lord, it's all spiritual and it all matters to you. So Lord, help us to learn rather than living with envy and strife and self-centeredness, to live in peace. First, to, to be at peace with you because being at peace with God will enable us to have the peace of God. And may we be a people, Lord, who are feel, filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control because we are filled with love, because we are filled with the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. May you have your way in us, God, and may we yield to you. And may you tame us, and may we follow you all the days of our lives. Lord, however many days we have left, 70 if due to strength, 80 as the psalmist said, may we yield to you and may we present to you a heart of wisdom on that great day when we meet you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Shall we stand and worship the Lord as we close this morning?